webinar on drone force in modern warfare. Today with us, we have three reputable guest speakers that I'm going to introduce after a brief introduction presentation. My name is Gisela Duro and I work for the communications unit at Finanville. After a short introduction on to drones, we are going to listen to our guest speakers, have a panel discussion, and we will end our webinar with a Q&A. Feel free to ask your question via chat throughout the webinar. But just to let you know, this won't pop up on your screen to not disturb you while the speakers are talking. The question will be collected and filtered by the admin during the hour Q&A session. So, First of all, I'm gonna start sharing my screen, yeah. So first of all, a short definition of drones. An immense aerial system commonly known as a drone is an aircraft without a human pilot on board. There are two main categories. There are those under the remote control of a pilot on the ground or in another vehicle, remotely piloted vehicles remotely piloted aircrafts or remotely operated aircrafts. And there are also other ones that are fully autonomous and that are based on pre-programmed flight plans or more complex dynamic automation schemes. Some type of drones are more frequently deployed in military operation and these are information surveillance, target acquisition and reconnaissance. They gather enemy information, they locate target and patrols hostile airspace. Then we have unmanned combat aerial vehicles. They are capable of neutralizing targets deep in the battlefield with extreme precision. They have a high maneuverability and minimal collater collateral damage. Then we have multipurpose ones and this combined of two first systems uh, they conduct army, armed reconnaissance against critical perishable targets and can also strike using self-guided weapons and there are also cargo drones which are designed to undertake delivery of ammunition and food supplies in the military context drones are used for reconnaissance for surveillance mission and airstrikes Tati tactically uh, drones are of paramount importance because they collect a lot of information discreetly and can even intervene remotely on a very precise target. There are of course advantages and disadvantages. As advantages we can find that they can lower costs, they have a high low operational altitude, they can avoid human casualties, they have a high adaptability through the usage of artificial intelligence, they can be used for remote surveillance and delivery. They have a long endurance, so they don't have to be refueled. They can map operating theaters. They can increase security through remote target destructions. And there's no political implication of no boots on the ground, and they can provide effortless pilot swap. But there are also disadvantages. So for example, artificial intelligence can also be a disadvantage because it means that these systems are less controlled of humans. Drones control might be manipulated or programmed by other parties, so for example they can be hacked. They are still not ready for close air support missions and they detach from civilian population on the ground. Sure, there are also a lot of challenges in the usage of drones in military operation. The precision of the target is very important for civilian security reasons, and this depends on the quality of the drone intelligence. Going to operation no longer necessarily involves physical combat and therefore requires secure connections. The use of drones must comply also with international law, which is very important. And as well as the war becomes more and more disconnected from the ground. Are we going to comprehend the violence of war and act the action committed by drones without having them physically in front of us. Moreover, there are mounted drone technologies that have been tested. There are along uh, with air anti-aircraft system, several cutting edge technologies are increasingly being deployed to 
counter drone forces superiority. There are RF, RF jammers, GPS spoofers, uh, HPM devices, net guns, and high energy lasers. Most likely, the best counter drone solution might be a mix of these technologies that I just mentioned. All this data should be collected, processed, and displayed in a scalable, sensor agnostic, and user friendly command and control software. As technology advances, drones are becoming more and more powerful in surveillance and warfare missions. There are several strategic technologies are uh, under development. For example, we have technologies allowed to carry out effective drone swarm missions, which is expected to be fully operational within the next decade. Geodetic GNSS receiver for high precision surveys. There is an integration also into an interconnected artificial intelligence platform to map urban indoor battlefields. So we are now curious to see how this tool will develop in the future and our speakers will tell us more about this. Thank you very much for tuning in and for listening. If you haven't done it yet, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter for the latest news on military on interoperability and new technologies. You can also subscribe to our newsletter on our website, finabel.org. Every week we have two to three new publications that you can enjoy. Now, uh, we have a little bit of a change of schedule, so our speaker Ryan Jarvis and uh, Pierre Cambusa from Ellister are going to speak. Ryan Jarvis is currently the North American sales representative for Ellister, the tethered drone company. He's an experienced professional in the military special operation, private security and law enforcement communities and a former naval aviator. U.S. Navy SEAL team, unmanned aircraft system, officer in charge, and a military law enforcement professional. Then we will have Mr. Pierre Camusto, uh, that is currently key account SEAL manager at Ellis there, that will be supporting him. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jarvis and Mr. Camusto. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I believe we have a uh, presentation that should be loaded up. And we're just waiting on the uh, presentation to be loaded up. Thank you very much. Just give us two seconds. Well, while they're loading up the presentation, I just want to say that uh, Pierre and I are very happy to be here. And we look forward to uh, the webinar and working together with everybody. Amy, nice to speak with you all and we'll be happy to exchange further with you afterwards. All right. Well, at least there, we're the Tethered Drone Company. We uh, design tethered UAS systems for persistent aerial ISR and tactical communications. A, a brief overview about our company. We were founded in 2014 in Lyon, France. Uh, since then, we've had over 600 tethered drone systems delivered to over 65 countries around the world. And since our inception, we have had over 60,000 successful tethered flight hours, and uh, that number keeps on growing every day. The French headquarters is located in Lyon, and our U.S. office is here in Boston, and we also have a training team that travels internationally. At least Air is recognized to be the leading tethered drone company across the globe. So what do we do and what are tethered drone solutions? So one of the benefits of having a tethered UAS system is the uninterrupted flight time. So you, you're not limited by your batteries or uh, gasoline engines. It provides secure high-speed data transfer through the unhackable tether system. Broadband over power line and fiber optic solutions exist with our tethering stations. And uh, why is that good? Because most communications with uh, UAS systems are provided over a, a radio link and um, our C2 communication is through the tethering system, so it cannot be jammed. It's push button, plug and play systems. So that goes along the uh, lines of the autonomous UAS systems. Very user friendly. You press a button and it flies. 
and it stays there. So it takes all the workload off the operator and allows you to focus on your mission. And of course, with safe, reliable, and proven tethered solutions, they're, they're safe. So you're not going to have any uh, major issues when utilizing them in um, warfare environments. So some of the key applications that tethered systems have been used for over the uh, last few years is tactical networks for situational awareness, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, and of course, battlefield management systems. Um, siege and hostage video streaming, when you're in that intense situation and they need uh, instant feedback to the commanders making the decisions, it's really important to have that uninterrupted, persistent surveillance so you can make the appropriate decisions. Of course, when you have pre-planned events and securities, such as uh, football games and the Olympics, you, know, you definitely need um, surveillance for those kind of situations because in our ever-changing world, everything is very dynamic. And clearly, there's a lot of civil unrest out there. So security has become an even more important since then. Counterterrorism operations, small special forces team for video, voice, and data, and of course, uh, border security operations. So some of the categories of military drones, we classify them in the Department of Defense here as group one through group five. The tethered UAS solutions tend to hang out in group one and group two. They're less than 55 pounds and a tethering station can provide uh, power for those units. Once you get up into the group three, four and five aircraft, in order to tether a system like that, the amount of power that would be required would, would be quite a bit. But our Orion 2 tethered UAS system falls in the group two for tactical UAS. So a lot of people want to know, or well, how does a tethered drone work? Is it just a, a drone attached to a piece of rope? No, not really. So the tethered UAS systems, they provide data and power through the tethering through the tether itself down to the station. And from that station, we have RJ45 connectors or ethernet that provide secure data back to your, uh, your ground control station or your GCS. And we do maintain an emergency radio link just in case uh, there is an emergency, you can take manual control with a hand control unit and safely uh, land the aircraft. So some use cases that we have for tethered systems. We have uh, mobile surveillance applications. So forward operating base surveillance or FOBs. When you uh, go out into an austere environment, you're gonna set up a forward operating base. And instead of having a permanent fixture to provide ISR, you can have a uh, smaller system such as uh, tethered UAS and you can launch it and you can provide a quick way to have surveillance around the, the forward operating base. And uh, you'll be able to take it down quite quickly if you need to in case of emergencies. Pop-up communications. So what you can do is you can fly your tethered UAS and you can have a um, communication network actually fixed to the system itself and you'll, ex you'll extend that, that live site for your radio. So you'll be able to extend the tactical capabilities and greater networking capabilities to provide the operator with real-time situational awareness for tactical decisions. Once again, FOB force protection. So on a uh, tactical tethered UAS, you can have both EO and IR um, high definition real-time video. Also, you can have different intelligence and um, tactical communication devices attached to your system as well. So you can have that continuous surveillance and protection for your, for your base, wherever you're operating. And also you have a mobile ad hoc network connections. So you can extend the capabilities and the lethality of your forces by having better situational awareness. And by extending the, uh, the capabilities of your, your radio systems and communications, you'll be able to extend both your video and your um, tactile communications to wherever it needs to go. Whether it's gonna be another fixed wing UAS that's gonna have operating as like a radio relay or a video relay to just ex extend what uh, you can see around your, um, your AOR. In the Orion Tactical UAS with ISR and manet capabilities, as you can see that you'll have the tethering station fixed to a FOB and then you'll be able to ex extend all the capabilities for whatever you want to do and get that real-time information back to your 
your commanders that can make the quick decisions. And those are information for, uh, for us, for Pierre and myself. And I hope to uh, be able to answer some questions. Pierre. Uh, well, thank you, Ryan. We will go afterwards during the questions and answer uh, to the next slide. Thanks. Yep. <laughs> so um, perhaps I should uh, talk a bit about uh, the, the German market size and forecast for the next few years. So um, since we start the Lister, we have seen growth demands, uh, which are putting the, 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 the trends that are incoming. So um, the North American market is growing each year, and there is a lot of m more demands on the for drones and military, military drones and for protections. It, these demands is uh, increasing also in every continent, North America, Europe and Asia are the most demanding for this technology, particularly Asia with China and Singapore, which are on the top grade um, manufacturing drones with brands such as DJI that you probably know, which are free flying drones. While uh, there is a lot to do in uh, Africa, Oceania and South America, this market are growing but slowly. We are expecting a gross demand within 2030. So. Outstanding. Well, that concludes our PowerPoint presentation. We'll turn it back over to Finabel to see if they uh, have any questions for us. Thank you very much for your presentation. If you have any questions, just send them to us and we are going to ask them. Okay, there is a question for you. That is, how long will it be until the technology has developed enough for a vehicle to be in motion while the system is de deployed? Well, the technology already exists. So you're talking mm -hmm. about the, the follow me function? Is that what we're speaking of? Yeah, it's a question from the audience and yeah, of course. So, so for a tethered UAS to be tracking a moving vehicle, it, it technology already exists. In order for it to have it be successfully integrated into various UAS systems, mm -hmm. you just have to have the engineers, engineer software to line up the uh, full motion video where you'll have a uh, GPS technologies to be able to have that follow me. And then the limits will be placed upon the um, flight characteristics of your UAS. So. If you have a boat or a small a vehicle moving at a very high rate of speed, well, the uh, technology will have to be um, capable for the UAS in order to keep up with that. So usually it's a smaller, smaller speed at this time, but it, that technology, we have it. Thank you very much. There is another question. With tethered drones, is there a safety system involved for loss of power or is the tether is cut for it to land safety? Is that yeah. a small emergency battery to allow it to land rather than be destroyed or on landing? Yes, I can't speak for every tethered drone that is out there in the industry, but I can speak for our tethered drones. So yes, we have a safety battery that provides enough power for the um, system to land safely. And if you're above um, a certain uh, meters, you actually have a, a parachute as well. 
So you can minimize the damage to the aircraft if there were to be an emergency. But yes, there's a safety battery on board that provides power to conduct a safe landing. Thank you very much. You're receiving a lot of questions. Another one is, can Orion be also used without a cable? Just to make it more adaptable to the situation. Elise Air's Orion uh, Tactical UAS is not designed to be flown without a cable, if, without the tether. It's designed as a tethered system for persistent intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Thank you very much. There is another one. Is the growth uh, in market military only, or is it also law enforcement? Well, uh, there is a gross optimum also with the, within the law enforcement and uh, civil security. So, in general, every market, but as we were talking about more the, the military um, drones and military warfare, I suggest that we focus on this demand. So, the development of counter UAS systems throughout the world have definitely increased the, the market for tethered UASs due to the fact that both data and C2 command and control communications is is sent through the uh, the micro tether, so that for the most part renders most counter UAS systems uh, ineffective against a tethered. So it's definitely increased for military and law enforcement and private security applications. Thank you very much. Uh, there is other questions. So is your company involved in counter drone development as well? Well, no, we all focus is on the, the manufacturing of tethered drone solution. And can tethered drones hypothetically remain in the air indefinitely? Yes, the um, the only limitation based is based on how long a, a tethered UAS can remain in the air is number one, your power supply. Do you have a uh, an effective power grid that can provide continuous power to your tethering station? And number two, what are the um, aircraft characteristics you have? Or is your aircraft uh, designed to stay in the air during all weather? Can your motors withstand operating for 24, 48, 72 hours? It's all dependent on the drone. But theoretically, yes. If you have a continuous power supply and your aircraft is designed to withstand the elements and the, um, the arduous nature of just flight in general, then yeah, it can, it can stay it can stay in flight. Thank you very much. So we have some other questions, but we have to move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, I know that you might have to leave soon. Uh, if you can, you can stay here for the panel discussion with the other two presenters. Uh, we will be happy about it. And then for more Q and A session, uh, thank you very much. So I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Major Gareth Abbott that works at SO2 Robotics and Autonomous Systems in the Future Force Development Branch of Army Headquarters, as well as conducting extensive research on this system and the wider industry that creates them. It also included the delivering Army Warfighting Experiments 19 and 20 in September and October of last year in a COVID secure environment. The RAS team are currently in the process of writing the British Army RAS strategy that will help to guide our technological transformation over the next decade. Previous relevant experience includes company command in 2PARA and two years in the operations cell of the US 82, uh, 82nd Airborne Division, North Carolina. Thank you very much for joining us today, Major. Uh, I give you now the floor. Thank you very much, Anarita. Uh, bonjour, bonjour, no. Uh, hola, hey, guten Abend, good afternoon, and thank you for including me in this important discussion. It's my pleasure to represent the British Army here today uh, to provide an insight to this rapidly expanding field of technology. Uh, I am Major Gareth Evans, as stated, my job title is SO2 Robotics and Autonomous Systems, or for short, we call it RAS. 
uh, and I work within the Future Force Development Branch of the Capability Directorate of the British Army Headquarters. Uh, I'm part of the British Army's uh, team developing the strategy for how we will integrate these systems into our doctrine training and uh, eventually our operating model. Uh, what I hope to achieve during this session is to inform the audience about how the British Army has come to its conclusions uh, about the future of drone use in modern warfare uh, through two current examples and how we're directing procurement and employment of these systems all within an ethical framework. Uh, there's a classic quote there, basically, you know, we need to learn to utilise the, the, the technology most effectively. It's not just about uh, purchasing the best technology. I'm flicking through the slides as we go. So uh, as I change topics, if you don't see a slide change, then please let me know. So definitions. I'm going to start by making two clear definitions to help frame uh, this discussion. Um, and these are what we mean by the terms drones and also modern warfare. Uh, so firstly, drones, uh, as already has been alluded to, you're, you're talking primarily about uh, air systems. I'm going to verge more, uh, you know, a bit more into land systems as well. Um, as we know, there's much more to this technology than a, a basic reference of, of that word. Um, we refer to it as robotics and autonomous systems because there's much more to them than, than calling them a drone. Um, so for my presentation today, I'll, I'll be referring to uncrewed physical systems, be they land, air or maritime, that can be uh, employed on operations. And in terms of modern warfare, initially I'll cover some of the lessons from the, the conflicts between Armenia and Azerbaijan last autumn as the use of drones in this conventional warfighting role was, was pivotal to the Azeris, uh, and, and this is indeed a, a current or modern war. Uh, however, much of the British doctrine points us towards the fact that land fighting forces are more likely to be deployed in the future to conduct operations under the threshold of warfare, being deployed, um, be that you know, counterinsurgency or peace support operations, particularly within an urban environment amongst the civilian population. Uh, so understanding how drones can be employed in this form of modern war will be key. So uh, I'll start by covering the employment of drones within Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Uh, in previous conflicts in this region, despite both sides operating uh, a predominantly uh, Russian-based equipment, Armenia's greater quality of soldier proved successful against Azerbaijan's larger numbers. However, it seems that uh, as a, uh, Armenia was preparing for the last war uh, and happy with their successes, whereas Azerbaijan, the Azeris, uh, put a lot of technological and doctrinal investments to prepare for the next war um, to ensure that they did better. And, and it certainly seems that they made considerable gains during this conflict. The Azeris invested in more advanced technology, including uncrewed aerial systems, uh, or UAS, as we're referring to them. They employed them to recce routes through the mountains, uh, positively identify Armenian forces, and then enabling long-range fires to engage those targets. Uh, not only being a decisive means of destroying a target, uh, this also created an element of surprise, as the Armenians would not have uh, any idea that they were being targeted from a distance. Uh, and this also then has the impact of um, negatively impacting their morale as well. There was also use of uh, armed uh, uncrewed aerial systems, for example, loitering munitions and uh, large UAS with weapon systems attached, increasing the range and accuracy with which targets could be engaged, as you can see depicted in the top left picture, with examples of these uh, drones employed in the top right two pictures. Long periods of reconnaissance and preparation, utilising UAS um, as the key sensor, meant that the Azeris were able to observe the battlefield orient their forces onto Armenian positions and engage, uh, enable key leaders to decide which uh, effector to act with to destroy Armenian equipment, such as armoured vehicles or uh, air defence platforms, as you can see in the bottom left picture, an air defence system there. Clearly, having good weather is definitely beneficial uh, to this, and, and in poor weather, this wouldn't have been as effective. This meant that the battles were being won in the shaping phase of the operation, uh, reducing the risk to manoeuvring ground forces that are employed more widely in the decisive phase. The UAS increased the ratio of the force available and greatly improved the rate of operations um, from the wider number of cheap UAS that are employed and the quicker passage of information that was enabled. 
This in, ter um, this in turn saw Azeri forces achieve an overwhelming success on several fronts early on in the campaign. The seeming uh, superiority of UAS effectiveness had a further detrimental impact on the morale of the Armenians, as, as you can see from the centre-right picture there of an explosion. Uh, you could, they would see daily footage of successful strikes destroying some of their most valuable pieces of equipment. So winning the fight in the air allowed the Azeris to subsequently build momentum on the ground. The Nagorno-Karabakh conflict has highlighted significant impact of the employment of drones um, in that modern war of a very conventional manner. While these areas did not use any ground drones or UGS, uncrewed ground systems, uh, in the conflict, the use of these would have been um, the use for these would have certainly have been plentiful, um, especially through the use of logistic resupply. As I'll come on to more in a moment. So now moving on to urban conflict. Um, and the employment of drones within the urban environment, which could be integrated for capturing currently that we, the British Army, are currently conducting around the world. By 2040, it's expected that 60. Three percent of the global population will live in an urban environment. These are uh, physically, culturally, and institutionally uh, very complex um, environments, and they're of increasing importance for global economic activity. Our adversaries, as we see in certainly in the likes of Mali and Afghanistan, do not have the funding or the recruitment base to compete in open conflict against la much larger forces such as ourselves. So um, they must operate below the threshold of fighting using subversive techniques while hiding amongst the population, insurgency tactics. This is much riskier for the forces conducting the counterinsurgency operations or the peace support operations, as the human element is the most important part and cannot simply be replaced by drones. These counterinsurgency or peace support forces need to be working for the urban population, with the urban population, uh, so must be very careful to keep the trust of the people, especially through keeping them safe and carefully targeting only uh, enemy forces. So this is where uh, offensive forms uh, of drone uh, use um, with autonomous decision making to engage with a potential enemy may cause potentially more harm than good, especially the employment of, say, uh, loitering ammunition uh, that must be used or wasted if an enemy cannot be targeted, uh, if they can't be found or if they move into a populated area. So the emphasis in the urban environment will be to utilise surveillance systems to increase the rate of the OODA loop. Uh, by OODA loop, as you can see on, on the right hand side of the screen there, I'm referring to the uh, observe, orient, decide and act loop. Uh, loop. Um, so this is as opposed to uh, simply using offensive systems. Drones will be increasingly required to build situational awareness about the conflict area, uh, as you'll have heard from Ellis Dare just prior. Um, what some of their drones can do, providing commanders with the information that they require to make timely and effective decisions. Uncrewed ground systems also, or UGS, will become increasingly important in this environment, as you see in, in the middle there, certainly, um, to replace soldiers for some of the most dirty, dull and dangerous roles that can be automated, such as uh, searching dangerous areas, uh, providing last mile resupply during a, a firefight or contested space, also can be done through the air, uh, and reducing the personnel required for larger rearward logistical trains, including through leader follower convoys uh, that are vulnerable to attack. So I've highlighted two contexts or um, lenses of modern warfare that drones can be successfully employed within uh, and demonstrating key functions for which they can increase operational effectiveness. I'm now going to move on to how the British Army sees the incorporation of RAS or drones uh, into how we operate. The UK Ministry of Defence's Integrating Operating Concept 2025 describes how the British Army is most likely going to be operating beneath the threshold of warfare for the foreseeable future. Uh, this is due to the competitive nature of operations, as I've already stated. Smaller uh, groups aren't able to, to match up to us um, on the same might or scale. So whereby our adversaries either do not want to wage war or they don't have the cap capability to do so. So this sees us operating on the box on the left, as you can see, we're in four levels of competition, protect, engage, constrain and fight. 
protecting ourselves, our allies or subdued populations, engaging with audience and adversaries to prevent conflict, constraining adversaries to ensure that they do not achieve their nefarious goals, with the final level being ready and willing to fight an enemy if necessary. So this means that we have to procure drones that can increase our operational effectiveness across all of these levels of competition to ensure we get the most effective use of their integration. So it doesn't mean simply purchasing offensive weapon systems to strike and kill adversaries. Um, in constraining or fighting, potentially yes, but not all of the time. We need to utilize this technology as a force multiplier to make us more combat effective across the entirety of the OODA loop and reducing the burden on the workforce and tasks that can be automated. Thus enabling our soldiers to focus on the human element of these operations. So these deductions have helped us to, uh, to guide us in uh, developing our RAV strategy for the British Army. At this stage of writing, and I must reiterate that this is not the final version, and we're still developing it, we've synthesized um, the key benefits to down, uh, down to what we're calling the four R's. So top left there, ratio, increasing mass. Top right, rate, increasing the tempo of decision making uh, and the action cycle. Bottom left, range, increasing both the long range fires that we possess, but also the range of our smallest units and what they can see and sense. And then the bottom right, reducing the risk that soldiers are taking while conducting operations, giving us more choice of how we can do things, even in some of the toughest circumstances. I'd potentially argue there's a fifth R that could be added, which is simply reduce or lowering um, the workload. Um, if you take, for example, self-driving cars nowadays, they don't necessarily um, impact any of those four R's in our daily life, but it does reduce the workload for the ease of completion, making life generally easier. So there's potential there, though that reduce in a military context will support the other four R's. So the areas that we are, what areas are we considering incorporating drones into our land fighting force? At the moment, we're starting with the technology that is available with the intent to increase our use of drones as they are tried and tested and meet the strict ethical guidelines that we strive to meet uh, all the time on operations. At this time, that focuses on logistics and increasing the light roll soldier performance. So these four R's in logistics and how drones will support us, as mentioned again, this is referring to ground drones here as opposed to the aerial ones, though aerial ones could be um, potentially put in here as well as the technology moves along. Ground drones will provide a method of increasing the ratio of our logistic platforms. As you can see on the top right, we've got our two drivers with our two vehicles. Um, but with leader follower drones, we can increase the vehicles and thus the supplies delivered by having uh, autonomous vehicles that follow that one vehicle with the one driver, then freeing up the rest of those drivers to then do other tasks. They'll increase the rate of deliveries as there'll be a reduction in crew fatigue. Um, so more journeys can be made. The range will be increased through electrification of their power supply and a removal of the reliance on fossil fuels, which are quite heavy uh, and costly to move around the battlefield and reducing the risk of human life within those vulnerable assets from attack in both um, the delivery of daily stores to the fighting echelon, all the way to the front and providing casualty evacuation and ammunition resupply for the soldiers in contact with enemy forces. And then looking at light roll forces, ratio would be increased through the use of drones, potentially more looking at um, uncrewed aerial systems here, by providing extra eyes in the sky so that the commanders can build their situational awareness, obtain the information they need to make a decision. Um, the rate of information passage to allow a quicker orientation, decision making and thus action will increase the tempo of operations, outthinking and outacting our enemies. Instead of a soldier doing a sketch map to show the commander, you've got it there, you can just direct the camera in that direction. Even small drones, be they aerial or ground in nature, can increase the range that we can sense. As you can see, a soldier can only see a certain amount, a certain distance, but we can push these sensors out much further. And the loss of these drones, while potentially costly, certainly initially, as the, the capability is growing, uh, it's less risky and less um, certainly politically risky than losing a, a human life, as we would all agree. So these are key aspects of modern warfare that can be greatly improved now by utilising currently available drones. This is not just about engaging and uh, killing that most um, people would typically associate modern drones with, 
Um, but modern warfare is growing less and less linear in its dis in distinction of the enemy, so we must be able to use drones to adapt to this. So to conclude, there are varying uses for drones in modern warfare, as we see in the current conventional and non-conventional operations. Uh, the British Army uh, currently considers these benefits to be that they will increase the ratio of a force, the rate at which a force can act, the range over which an effect can be made, while minimising risk to human life and loss of expensive assets, all through reducing the cognitive and physical burden of a force. We need to be integrating this technology to prepare for the next war and not make up for our failings in the current or uh, the last war. Um, however, as with all weapon systems, drones must be developed and employed within an ethical framework to prevent war crimes being committed that people will then try and potentially blame on machinery rather than, than human behaviour. We've got a lot of responsibility to come with this, uh, this technology that we bring in. Thank you very much for your time. It's uh, been a pleasure to talk and I look forward to the, the following speakers and any questions that you have. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. So we will move on to the next speaker, our last speaker for today. That is Andrea Gilli. Andrea Gilli is senior researcher at NATO Defense College. His research is focused on issues revolving around military innovation and technological change. He has worked or, and conducted research for the U.S. Department of Defense, the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Italian Air Force, and more. His publications have been featured in journals such as International Security Journal of Strategic Studies, Security Studies, he has been awarded uh, with several prizes, including a 2020 Best Research Article Award on U.S. Foreign Policy and Strategy as a part of the American in the World Consortium. Thank you very much for being us with for being here with us, Mr. Gilly. Um, I give you the floor. Can you please put your mic and camera on? Oh, I'm I'm back in the uh, in our presenter group area. Have we dropped out again? Can anyone hear me? Yes. I'm back in the presenter area. I don't know if we may have dropped out again. Um. So, uh, Ms. Jill is having some technical problems for the moment. Are you still there? Just checking I've still got connection. Yes, yes, we're still here. We're just waiting for Mr. Gilly that is currently out of this room. While we're waiting for the uh, technical difficulties to get resolved, uh, would you like us to answer some more of the uh, questions from the chat room? Yes, exactly. This is what I was going to do. Um, so we have some more questions, actually. Um, so how does a tether UAS compare to a regular UAS? AS for cybersecurity, can it be considered as more robust in preventing hacking of control and, pay and payload signals? If you can ask. Absolutely. Can so with a standard unmanned aircraft system or, or drone, you're gonna get your, your C2 and you get your data and video wirelessly. And of course, whenever you implement that kind of technology, you there is a way to, to get around it and hack it. With the tethered system, both data and video and communications is sent through the micro tethered to the secured tethering station. And of course, back to your secured network. So as long as your network is secured, 
then the tethering station information is also secured. Thank you very much. We have another question. Seems like everyone is enjoying your presentation. So what place should military drones be in international law, you think? Well, we're actually, that's probably a question more for the major because uh, at least there, we're not, uh, we're not going to be involved with the international law and with warfare, things like that. So maybe if Major Gareth has a better answer to that. Um, so we, yeah, we're looking at classification of, of things at, this, uh, at the moment. We've got a generic un, uh, uncrewed architecture that's being created at the moment. So while I can't give any specific answers to uh, what classifications could be, it is definitely something that we as the, the British Army uh, are looking into with the Air Force, uh, of course, because some of these systems will go much higher than the land domain. Um, so I don't have an answer for that right at this moment, but that is something that we are looking to classify and that we will have uh, an answer to hopefully in the, in, the, in the near future. Thank you very much. We have other questions. The deployment of tether drone doesn't reveal the potential position of friendly forces. So with a tethered system, you're, it's not designed to be a uh, covert. Clearly, it's going to be an overt, and that can work both as a deterrent. But yes, I mean, if you have a tethered system, and that will reveal the location, if you can see the uh, actual UAS that's tethered down to the FOB, but they're not designed to uh, be covert. It's an overt deterrence, and also it allows you the freedom to have tactical communications and um, extended surveillance for the safety of personnel. Thank you very much. We have another question. So what's your views when it comes to integration of drone technologies and artificial intelligence? Once drone, can drone be used a from force or as an offensive force? We have seen such uses by terror outfits in Saudi Aramco attack, Venezuelan president attack. Well, with any form of technology, it's not necessarily the technology that is uh, the issue. It's going to be the individual that uses it. So the systems that we design are designed for the safety and protection of individuals. But there are systems out there manufactured by other industries that are for um, more kinetic effects. But that's not what we do at Elise Air. But anyone can use anyone can use UAS technology for good or for harm of others. It's up to the individual. In terms of the military use of uh, UAS and certainly the offensive use, um, there's there's varying different methods that we can utilize in, in terms of processing this information. We've certainly got, at the moment, we're predominantly using human in the loop uh, with when we, when we refer again to the OODA loop, and that is as uh, the autonomous uh, systems come up with certain pieces of information that then comes through a human, an operator of, or a synthesizer of the information uh, that can then pass it on to the next part of the, uh, of the chain. Um, ultimately being that the act, the actual, the decision to execute a target, be that a physical thing, a, a, a person or in, engaging with a, uh, a vehicle or, or whatever it needs to be uh, acted upon, has a human making that decision. Even with human on the loop, which is very similar again, where a human monitors the decision making process before the act is then uh, carried out, you would then have a human giving permission um, for that to, to, to be taken part, uh, to happen. Uh, in, a, in a lot of things like uh, in the markets that you can see nowadays, you've got a human you know, out of the loop. Things can still happen without human interaction, uh, but a human would then dip in and monitor on a regular basis. I don't see that being a direction that uh, military drones would be going anytime soon certainly not for um uh, offensive action because we need to we need to ethically we need to make sure that we uh, fully understand what is happening with these um offensive actions going on from drones even if it's being carried out by a robot there is still a human uh, on the loop to make sure that it is being delivered ethically and in line with the intent of the of the mission well said thank you thank you very much uh, there is actually another question for Major Evans. 
Within the British Army's development of RAS, is there any consideration of partner forces such as the US or France with relation to interoperability with partners? Absolutely, this is something that we uh, are constantly considering because you know we hope to remain as a, a, a reference army to our allies uh, to make sure that we can interoperate with them. Ultimately, if we do go on operations, we are stronger together. So be it with the US, with France, with Germany, other EU, um, uh, NATO nations, if we, we go on operations, we need to understand the level of oper uh, interoperability that we want to achieve, um, be it uh, just working similar, um, you know, working in different sectors, but together, or do we want to work in and amongst each other's units, which we typically can do a little bit more easily with US units. As we bring in um, technology that is that is more advanced and different nations are purchasing different uh, pieces of technology, probably because nations want to purchase their own uh, through their own business chains and whatnot, we've just got to learn where um, we can make things generic enough that we can then uh, be interoperable, be it through power supplies, uh, and that we're able to to charge from the same uh, NATO-specific standing uh, standard charging point, or be it potentially the software. You know, a good example would be if we use um, Windows versus iOS. You know, they're not as compatible as we'd like them to be, but there are patches to make that happen. So uh, yeah, we all feel those. Uh, we all feel that that gripe but it, it's something we we do look at we take very seriously and we engage with um, international partners on a regular basis to make sure that while we need to go our own direction as the british army with british industry we also need to build collaboration internationally to make sure that as allies we can work together uh, and we don't have a if if an incident should go off in the world that requires an instant uh, an instant response we're not waiting for these uh, systems to patch and make them work together. It's not a direct answer to the question. It's something we are doing and we are considering uh, for the future. Thank you very much. There is another question for you. Are there lessons learned from the Watchkeeper program? Um, I so I don't personally have those lessons learned from. Uh, watchkeeper so I couldn't answer specifically to that however learning lessons is an incredibly important part of the training uh, and the feedback from operations that we do as an army because ultimately we have to learn on a daily basis from updates and tactics uh, tactics techniques and procedures that the enemy are conducting uh, ways to make ourselves more efficient and also to prevent the silly things that you know cause injury and whatnot and operations from uh, prevent them from happening so we we will constant we constantly look at any lessons um, that we can take away from operations and training to make sure that we are a more efficient uh, and effective operational force for the future. So sorry, I can't answer that specifically, um, but we do learn from them. Thank you very much. Very much. There is another question for you. Uh, are we close to having- I think you're on mute still. Do you hear me? Loud and clear. Yes, <laughs> perfect. Are we close to having the technology? No, nope, still can't hear you, Anna. No. Now. Now. No. Major Evans, radio check. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good to me. Good to me. Do you hear me? I hear you loud and clear. Okay. Can I go over the question? Are we close to having the technology to provide follower vehicles you described? We still haven't got you, Anna. Oh, I no. certainly haven't. Um, I, can, I can answer the technology. So the question was actually previously asked about the follow follow me functions on, um, on uh, UAVs. Are they talking more of a tethered UAVs or regular uh, untethered UAVs? I can answer both. Yeah, yes, there is follow me function where where uh, UAS systems are able to lock on and, and follow uh, various targets. Thank you. Do you hear me now? Yes. 
Yes. <laughs> I think Major Evans is here. Oh, I can hear you now. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Maybe yeah, it's clearly a problem on my end. Sorry about that. Sorry, no, it's okay. So we have another question. The enormous propagation of the state of the art technology around the world will increase the capability of the nation and the individuals to create more sophisticated systems and as a consequence to decrease our ability to counter them? Uh, so I think, yeah, the question is about how we counter the, this technology. Um, we are constantly trying to, whilst we create things that we can use in operations, we're, we're constantly trying to look at their vulnerabilities, um, but also looking at en enemy vulnerabilities as well and how we can we can counter, uh, counter them. Uh, our systems that we bring in will probably be able to be countered in some way or other, but then we learn from that to, uh, to ensure that the next iteration of that product that comes in um, <clears throat> is then either more uh, less susceptible to being countered in that way, or we employ our techniques in a different um, manner so that they, they then become less um, counterable. I mean, for example, you know, talking about the tetherable UAS, yeah, it could potentially be seen that that is where the communications platform would be. Or if you see a UAS in the sky, that's where communications will be. We would then change, you know, would look at changing techniques if that started to get uh, uh, get targeted, for example. It, it's a constant game of, um, you know, moving the, the goalposts to make sure that we're, we're uh, uh, matching or ahead of our enemy tactics, techniques and procedures. Thank you very much. There is also another question on what is the type of material used for the data link? Is it optic fiber? For the micro tethers that we manufacture, we do have uh, we do have fiber optic options, but we also have a broadband over power line. Thank you very much. I have another question for for you, Mr. Jarvis. So, what are the future challenges that swarming drone face? Technical, strategical, implementational, and in terms of casualties? Yeah, so that's actually that's a big thing around the world these days with the decrease in cost of UAS and the increase of capabilities. Drone swarms that are autonomously controlled without human interaction are a very real threat. So the future, the future of that particular side of the UAS market is um, is dangerous. You know, if the the wrong people want to uh, inflict serious bodily harm to people or property, the utilizing drone swarms, then it's it's going to be dangerous, and it's going to be up to uh, you know our partner forces to develop technologies to prevent that from happening. And they're out there. There are counter UAS devices that can handle drone swarms. But those capabilities have to increase along with the increasing um, amount of technology that's available. It's going to be a new world very quickly. Thank you very much. Um, there's another question for Major. So do British Armed Forces for I think I've lost Anna's uh, sound again. So if it's a question for me, can you relay please, Ryan? Yes. Do you hear me? I can hear you. Major okay. Evans, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. I'll, I'll relay her question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do British Armed Forces foresee the use of drones for civilian use for field humanitarian aid personnel deployed in crisis regions for early warning or intel gathering purposes? Do British Armed Forces foresee the use of drones for humanitarian efforts? Um, yeah, well, absolutely. As, as mentioned, we would look to use drones in all um, in the full spectrum of warfare, be that down to you know humanitarian operations on, on the one end and, and peace support all the way through to, to war fighting. So it's finding uh, the most effective um, technology that can support us in in all in all forms. Uh, uh, I mean, that's not warfare per se, but in our operations and how we uh, support uh, both the population of the UK and our interests abroad. Uh, abroad. So it, it's certainly something that we'd look at and we'd want to integrate for, for humanitarian operations as well, yes. Thank you. Did you get that? Thank you very much. Thank you also for helping me. There is other questions. So uh, does the technology to make drones evolve in groups? 
swarms doing operation exist? Can you repeat the question? Does the technology exist for drone swarms? Yes, to make them evolve in groups doing operations. Evolve in groups? Evolve. Evolve, yeah. So, so smart drone swarms? I suppose so. Like, I believe is that what they are asking, yes. Is that for me? I think it's just for the group. Uh, yeah. I'll give my two cents and then I can, uh, I can uh, repeat the question. So, yes, there's nothing that's impossible. Uh, technology clearly exists for autonomous operation of UAS systems. So, yes, it's there. It's just a matter of um, who's using it. Perfect. Thank you very much. There is another question for Major Evans. This question is for Major Evans. I'll, I'll relay for you. Thank you very much. It would seem NATO standards such as Stanag 4609 for media would be a baseline requirement for UAS and UGS. Would you agree? She said that for Major Evans, it would seem that NATO standards such as Stagneg 4609 for media would be a baseline requirement for UAS and UJS. Would you agree? Uh, yeah, uh, well, absolutely. We are looking at uh, standards that are already out there. I mean, a lot of the NATO standards we align ourselves with because then it makes doctrine much easier to follow if we are following one central standard for our army as NATO would. So we take we take the standards into consideration. Um, and we're also, you know, as mentioned, working with uh, our allied partners to see what their standards are and to understand if our standards are in line with the rest of the world if we're you know and while we want to be ethically strict with how we uh, utilize drones we also need to look at how the rest of the world are doing it and see uh, you know what right and wrong is across the world so we can we can amend our standards and um, so yeah we take into account all these documents uh, and we're using them at the moment to apply our own standards certainly within uh, our generic uncrewed architecture I think you're on mute. Now you hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much for replying to this big amount of questions. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Gille won't be joining because there are some technical issues. So, we'll conclude this webinar here. We replied to a lot of questions, which is great. Thank you very much for helping. Um, and the presentation of Mr. Gilly will also be recorded and will be presented in the Afterview webinar that people can look at on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much, Major Evans, and thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jarvis, for joining us today. Thank you for replying to our question, and thank you to all our participants. We really apologize about this technical question that are beyond, beyond our power. Thank you, everyone. And uh, yes, let's see you in our next <coughs> webinar. Thank you for joining. If you want to have some concluding uh, remarks, speakers. Sure, thanks for having us here. If anybody has any questions or wants to get in contact for with uh, Elise Dare, you can definitely go to our website, elisedare.com, or you can contact uh, the folks over at Finabel and you get in touch with us. Hope to hear from you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if Major uh, Evans can hear me now, but if he has some conclu concluding remarks as well. Major Evans, can you hear her? I can't. I mean, I, I, I presume it's uh, a similar do, sort of thing. So do you have any closing much. remarks? Thank you all very much for your time. It's, it's a pleasure to represent the British Army uh, here today. Uh, if you would like to get in contact with myself uh, in, in touch uh, then please let Finnabel know and we can pass on uh, my email address and we can we can go from there thank you all very much and look forward to seeing you here for the uh, the next Finnabel lecture thank you thank you very much everyone thank you you can also fill in the form as a survey to help out our, um, us improve with our future webinars thank you very much thank you everyone and have a good evening